Hi, and welcome back to U.S. History with me, Mr. Snyder. Today we start our unit on the Vietnam War, which, depending on when you start it, uh, we say lasts from about 1963 to about 1972, 1973. Here are your learning targets for the day. We're going to describe the reasons why the United States helps the French fight the Vietnamese. We're going to talk about how the U.S. gets directly involved in the war in Vietnam, and we'll analyze through a chart uh, how the U.S. increased its involvement in Vietnam. So first of all, where in the world is Vietnam? Well, you can see here that um, here's Japan, and Korea is just off to its west, uh, where we fought the Korean War. And then you can see down here in the inbox that... Uh, it's this South e Southwest uh, Asian country, Southeast Asian country. Uh, Vietnam is the little snake around the border here. Laos and Cambodia are right next door. We're also going to be talking about them. And very close to them is also Thailand. And so these nations are right uh, south of China as well. And that will play into it here um, in the war very soon. So a brief history of Vietnam. Before World War II, um, it was colonized by France. France colonized all three of those countries I just mentioned, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And they called it Indochina. They use it for raw materials. Um, imperial, they imperialize it. And they treat the Vietnamese citizens very harshly, almost less than human. And they are not going to take it anymore. So this man, Ho Chi Minh, founds the Indochinese Communist Party in 1930, and he will become the leader of the anti-French movement and later the leader of the anti-U.S. movement. During World War II and Japan's period of imperializing all of the Pacific, it takes over Indochina, and uh, Ho Chi Minh uh, forms what is called a group called the Viet Minh. And the Viet Minh are communists whose goal is to win independence from any foreign ruler, whether that be the United States, Japan, France, whoever, they want independence. When Japan loses World War II, Vietnam goes ahead and declares its independence, and Ho Chi Minh is made their leader. So we now have the country of Vietnam, but France, France isn't so sure about that. France wants another shot, and so they move back in after World War II, and they say, well, we had this land and area colonized before Japan took it over, so we should have it back. And they move back in and take over the southern portion of the country, which we, uh, we supported as the U.S. And this, states, uh, this sets the stage for the rest of the war, because we'll be fighting in the south, and Ho Chi Minh will fight his um, imperial aggressors from the north. So it's a communist north versus a non-communist south. In 1950, Truman enters the war because uh, China had just lo been lost to communism. We don't want to see another Southeast Asian country fall, so we give $15 million in aid to France. And from 1950, Eisenhower in 1952 also continues the aid going to France to fight this war, and we give over $2 billion in aid, and our former friend turns into our new enemy. Just like the Soviet Union, we were fine with them during World War II and not fine with them afterwards. Now we, support Ho Chi we supported Ho Chi Minh against Japan in World War II. Now he's a communist aggressor. Now he's got to go. And Eisenhower all puts, puts this all in perspective of the domino theory. And so we cannot let one unstable country such as Vietnam fall to communism because if the first one falls, then the rest of them will sure, uh, surely fall as well. And France has a hard time um, with this, just as we'll have a hard time with this, because they lose the war and they give up in 1954 at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, or the French outpost where they finally surrendered. And so we, along with the Soviet Union, France, and North Vietnam, all meet in Geneva, Switzerland to hammer out a peace agreement, and we decide that uh, Vietnam will be divided at the 17th parallel. 
and elections will take place in 1956. And so the North will be communist, the South will not be communist. So here are your new countries and your new leaders. We have North Vietnam, led by Ho Chi Minh, they're communist, and they are the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. And then we have uh, South Vietnam, led by No Dinh Ziem, Z-M, like a Z sound. And they are anti-communist. They're known as the Republic of Vietnam, or the RVN. And you might see something in our uh, textbooks and primary source documents about the RVN, and that means South Vietnam. So ZM is pretty corrupt, and he restricts religion, but hey, he's friendly with the United States, so we don't care. As long as he's anti-communist, that's most important. He cancels elections because he knows he'll lose. He becomes the basically dictator of South Vietnam into the 1960s. Um, now we also have to introduce this group into the mix called the Viet Cong, and this is going to be kind of confusing. They're an opposition group that's stationed in South Vietnam, in the jungles, in the mountains, and they are, um, they're, they're communist, and they want all of Vietnam to be communist. So they work with Ho Chi Minh to attack the ZM government. And Ho Chi Minh actually supports and supplies these Viet Cong via the Ho Chi Minh Trail. You might hear in our primary source documents uh, these Viet Cong referred to as VC or Charlie. And the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which they were supplied, is a network of paths that kind of snakes over into Laos and Cambodia and then back into South Vietnam to supply all the Viet Cong rebels there. So they lack American technology and weapons, but they're still so effective with their hit-and-run guerrilla fighting tactics. So they'll attack you, and then they'll disappear. They'll attack you, and then they'll disappear. They fight, and they hide. They, run, they hit and run. They blend in very well with the general population because they don't have a uniform. They wear civilian clothing, which makes it difficult for the United States to tell who's who, and they also have a network of tunnels in the mountains where they hide. They can launch surprise attacks and disappear quickly. Uh, the Kennedy administration, after Eisenhower, actually sends people to solve this problem in Vietnam. He sends advisors, and these advisors tell South Vietnam how to fight. ZM's popularity plummets in his country, and with a support of the United States in uh, early November 1963, ZM is overthrown and assassinated. And Kennedy wanted to withdraw the advisors at that point and get us out of this situation, but later in November he is assassinated before he can. And so that's one of the conspiracy theories is that the Vietnamese actually assassinated Kennedy because we assassinated their leader. And so Johnson is the one who escalates the war, and he does this through the Tonkin Gulf Resolution or the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. It's called both, and it gives the president expanded war powers. He does this because a North Vietnamese boat allegedly fired upon an American destroyer in the Gulf of Tonkin, but then we'll learn through some primary source documents that that is actually not true. And so Johnson, at that point, launches some bombing raids over North Vietnam as well called Operation Rolling Thunder. And Operation Rolling Thunder had, we dropped more bombs on Vietnam, North Vietnam, than we did all of Europe, all the ax, uh, allied powers in Europe combined. That is a lot of bombs on a little, little country. And so you can see here our troop levels grow all upwards of 500,000 in 1968, and at first the nation actually supports the war, but not afterward, not until we see how many young men are actually dying in this war. Here you can see, compared to the most recent war we were in, the Iraq War, the number of deaths per year and per month. So we're upwards of almost 2,500 deaths per month in the sixth year of um, Vietnam, and this only goes through the sixth year of Iraq, but you can see much more effective and much less deadly fighting in Iraq compared to Vietnam. 
And you can see that the Vietnam War ranks about fourth on our levels of casualties with 58,000 and so. And that is, um, that, that it's still a very emotional war to most people because they either know someone that fought there or they have somebody in their family that fought there. And it still is very controversial. Why were we, why were we there? to contain communism, who cares? I mean, a lot of people were against it, and we'll get into that as we go throughout the chapter. That's the end of your learning targets for this section. Make sure you fill them out, and I'll see you back in class tomorrow. Bye-bye.